uh, is Jim Neerum, who will be talking on compound representation. So I'll also, uh, um, I don't usually do this in talks. By the time you get to me, everyone's thanked the organizers and all. And I usually don't do that. But in this case, it really is true. I had heard about rumors about this uh, uh, symposium occurring. And I was definitely planning on coming up here. And I was really delighted uh, when, when Andre asked me to, to speak in it. Because uh, I never worked uh, with Jim. But uh, when you go through things like the old neuro tree about relationships and so forth, uh, most of my connections uh, through Jim and through the SUNY group really come from people who've, who've, su who've been trained here and subsequently came to work with me. Uh, first being Eric Hargreaves, whose name has already been uh, uh, given uh, a couple times today uh, by, by Matthew and, and Wendy, and then also currently Hee Kyung Lee's a, a, a postdoc of mine who worked with Andre. And uh, my relationship with the SUNY group also extends uh, even before that, because that's actually what got me interested in play cells. When I was a grad student at Caltech, I was working with the David Van Essen doing visual cortex recordings in, in monkeys. And uh, right around after the time that the, the famous Muller, QB, and Ronk 1987 papers came out, uh, Bob came gave a talk at Caltech. And I, this is one of the, you know, the snapshot memories I'll have the rest of my life, sitting in the audience just like with my jaw dropping. My god, what are these cells? I have to study these cells. And that changed my research focus and to do a postdoc. And that's what brought me to, to Bruce's lab to, uh, to study uh, 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 play cells uh, for a postdoc. But then things go deeper as you go backward to my educational history. It turns out that I later found out that Jim and I were both alumni from Haverford College, which is this uh, small Quaker school outside of Philadelphia. It turns out David Alton also was a, uh, uh, a graduate of that school. And uh, of course, he was at, at Hopkins, and that's where I am now, so more things. And then, of course, I love this fact that John O'Keefe and I went to the same high school together, just about you know 30 blocks north, uh, uptown of here at uh, this small Jesuit school here in New York. So just lots of very strange things. And uh, you know, at the time when I went to Bruce's lab, I had knew, knew none of this, this, this history and all. But it, you, if you can believe in fate or kismet or something, you know, I went to Bruce's lab to study something totally different. We were doing culture scene injections of dentate gyrus, and that was a disaster. But we started finding strange things about place fields rotating, being very non-local view-like, and, and doing when we disoriented the animals and things were going on. And I remember another conversation in the hallway talking to Bruce about the results I'm getting. And he says, you really need to nail this down and record head directions simultaneously. So that's what I started doing. And we started finding uh, uh, results like this. You already, uh, Bruce already showed this slide earlier. Um, and we started finding things where when you recorded head direction cells and place cells simultaneously, uh, here's an example of uh, we just got these spontaneous rotations sometimes. Uh, there was a cue card there. It's not shown here, but there was this, this is the typical Muller type cylinder with the, with the cue card. And here's a head direction cell that uh, after two minutes or so in this, as the rat foraged around, the cell just spontaneously rotated its preferred direction about 90 degrees, stuck around there for a few minutes, and then rotated back to its original orientation and stayed that way for the rest of the, uh, the session. And the, head, the, the place cell we record at the same time, uh, we see all the same thing. It rotated in synchrony its place field with the head direction cell. So here it's starting at the south, it rotates to the, to the west, uh, and then comes back again. So showing that the, the, the place cells and the head direction cells really were a tightly coupled uh, system. Um, uh, some other interesting examples we had uh, of, of head direction cells rotating uh, relative to, uh, to, to landmarks. So here's another head direction cell that in two minutes had a nice uh, tuning curve about to the southwest direction. At this point, we actually took the whole cylinder, it was on a, a platform, a rotating platform, and we just very rapidly rotated it 180 degrees. Uh, and as you can see, the cue card was here, now it's over here. And this actually caused uh, a, a, a momentary uh, loss of tuning or, or, or less uh, a strong tuning of the head direction cell, kind of similar to what Andre was just showing, but then it recovered itself. But then at this point, we started rotating the, the platform very slowly. It took about... Uh, uh, two, about f over four minutes or so, I was very slowly rotating the whole platform uh, in the opposite direction to where eventually it got to the same uh, orientation as before. But what we, what we saw, notice what's happening here is as the, the, the whole platform, the, the cylinder is being rotated clockwise, the head direction cell actually started rotating the opposite direction, counterclockwise. So again, it's being totally divorced from any external sensory cue. There's nothing on the platform, there's nothing in the world out there that is causing this head direction cell to rotate in a counterclockwise direction. Uh, but, but, but there it is, 
rotating in the opposite direction until it actually gets here. And now it realigns itself in the same orientation relative to the cue card as it started out with. And now the cue card suddenly has lost control over the cell again. And now the, the head direction cell starts rotating along with the cue card. So there's a period of time where this head direction cell, the system uh, was just free floating kind of, rotating, presumably uh, accumulating path integration error until it uh, uh, became in the same, in the, in the, in the, the, the sort of the area of control uh, of, the, of the cue card and then it locked in again and then the, the external world regained control over, over the system. So this is showing some, some of the internal dynamics that we've talked about. These are themes that we've talked about all, all along uh, many times in the meeting before about the internal dynamics of the system uh, decoupling from, from external uh, cues. Uh, to, to reinforce that more, uh, Eric Hargreaves, when he came to the lab, now Eric is mostly known for the work in my lab in terms of his uh, experiments with the lateral entorhinal cortex showing that they were non-spatial compared to the medial entorhinal cortex, at least when there were RNA local objects and so forth. But another experiment that, that he did uh, in, in collaboration with Yogan Arasimha, where they recorded uh, place cells and head direction cells uh, simultaneously. Uh, and this is a, a busy slide, so we're just going to look at a few things. But in this experiment, we had the rat in a, in a box and with a cue card. And after recording the place cells and the head direction cells, these are all simultaneous recordings here. We had eight head direction cells and oh, it's about maybe 20 or so place cells, 15 or so. Anyway, um, uh, if we rotated the cue card, uh, by 90 degrees in the presence of the rat. The rat's in there, and the cue card rotates. And what you see is, uh, if you look at the, the head direction cells first, uh, they're not affected by that. So he, this head direction cell continues to fire uh, in the southeast. This one fires northwest and so forth. Uh, so when, when the cue card is rotated in the presence of the rat, is that the, the rat ignored it. And, and in this particular experiment, different things happen in different experiments. But here's a case where certainly uh, the, the head direction cells and the play cells didn't really care about the cue card. But of course, now you can say, well, maybe there are local cues on the surface of the platform that the cells were tied to. So what they did, they, they, they put the rat into a bucket and covered it up. And very slowly, over the course of about two minutes, rotated the bucket 90 degrees one way and also rotated the cue card 90 degrees the opposite direction. And sometimes we would have a head direction cell we were recording, and during that whole two minute time, if the, if the rat was facing in the preferred direction of the head direction cell, that head direction cell was tonically active for the whole two minutes, you know, for two minutes while the, the system, the, the, the bucket was being rotated slightly. And then we take the rat out and put it back in the uh, uh, environment, and what you see is now the, the head direction cell has rotated 90 degrees the same way we had rotated the, the rat in the bucket, Whereas, again, the cue card rotated the other way, it didn't care about it. So here, again, is showing the, the, uh, the, 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 the internal directional sense really was being uh, uh, overriding any information from any external landmarks, either the cue card on the wall or anything within the environment. Now, what, what Eric also did was, and I'm not showing here, but another experiment, and you can see, if you look at some place fields, you'll see the same thing. The place fields also rotated in the same direction the head direction cells did. Uh, in other experiments, uh, uh, Eric recorded uh, CA1 cells with medial entorhinal cells, combination of the grid cells, boundary cells, and so forth, and showed the same effect that the CA1 play cells and the, head, and the MEC cells also were tightly coupled. So more evidence that, at least under these conditions, uh, this system really was very tightly coupled. What the head direction cells did in the anterior thalamus, what the play cells did in CA1, and what the medial entorhinal cortex cells did, they all did the same thing under these conditions, showing this, this, this tight coupling amongst these different uh, types of, of, of cells. Um, so I'm going to switch gears a little bit now to talk about, but in the same themes though, talking about some other experiments that we did, also looking at uh, different reference frames, similar to what Andre's talking about uh, in, in our version of local global reference frames. Uh, one difference being that we're not asking the rats to do any spatial tasks and to actually to pay attention to any, any task, and we're not training the rats over many times with these different reference frames. The rats are trained in an environment that's very stable with this uh, local cues on the track, these different textures, and then the standard cues on the wall. Uh, we, t we were inspired by uh, work by Matthew Shapiro and, and Heike Tsnilla and Howard Eichenbaum uh, doing similar experiments in, on a plus maze, where they do these double rotation experiments. The cues rotate one way on the track and another way on the, on the, on the wall. But these are probe tests. They, they, we, just, we just would insert these probes uh, in the middle of otherwise stable uh, configurations just to see if we pull the system apart, you know, what, what kind of interesting uh, results do we see. Uh, so here's an overhead view of the, uh, the track. The rat runs around on the circular track here. These are the black curtains on the wall with the, the standard, the standard uh, cues on the wall. 
And the manipulation is we rotate the track always counterclockwise and the cues on the wall always clockwise by different amounts. This is kind of our version to do very similar experiments as what, what John did and, and, and the Mosers with their morph box. We wanted to make uh, different manipulations in a, in a graded fashion by a small mismatch, larger, 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 to see when we can start seeing the dynamics of when did the system start to break apart? Can we look at evidence of attractor dynamics and remapping and so forth across different parts of the system? And uh, we've done, you know, people may be sick of reading our papers on this. Uh, and we've done many papers over the years uh, doing these, but we just keep finding interesting things. I actually want to give up these experiments, but, but we keep wanting, we, we do more, uh, we, we find more interesting things about that. And, and one thing we found was uh, uh, Yoga Narasimha, when he was, did, did this experiment with head direction cells and CA1 cells, uh, he found that the head direction cells were almost always controlled by they rotated counterclockwise their preferred directions, controlled by the cues on the wall, the distal landmarks, which is the standard finding of, of uh, the, the, the head direction cells under most conditions are controlled by, by the distal landmarks. Um, uh, and, and that's what we, we saw here. Whereas very few times today rotate with counterclockwise with the, with the local cues. They care about the global. But the interesting thing was whenever we had more than one head direction cell recorded simultaneously, they all did the same thing. They all rotated one way or the other. In contrast to CA1, where these are, uh, uh, in, in, when you just look at ensemble recordings of more than one play cell, about 15% of the time, all the play cells we had rotated one way with the cues on the wall. About 10% of the time, they all rotated counterclockwise. But most of the time, 75% of our experiments, we always saw evidence that at least one play cell rotated in the opposite direction from the others. So it's showing a split representation. So the head direction cells were always coherent, whereas the play cells typically would split. At least a couple of place fields of one would rotate against the majority rule. So, so here's a clear indication, though. This what I was talking about earlier about these systems being really tightly coupled together. Here's an exception. Uh, if the head direction cells, at least the ones we recorded, were coherent, but the play cells weren't uh, coherent, at least some of these play cells had to be uh, a non-coherent with, with the head direction cell system. So what, what kind of cues uh, would do it? Well, clearly, the fact is the play cells, you know, a lot of them were being controlled then by the local cues on the track. And here's a new data we have not published yet by uh, Sean Wong, a grad student in the lab. And uh, we've now recorded data from you know, dozens of animals in this task now. And, and Sean started looking at all the place fields we recorded o over, the, over the years. And she just plotted out here. Uh, uh, the, on, from 0 to 360 of uh, uh, the location on the track, starting here and going counterclockwise around the track. And the red lines here indicate the boundaries between the different textures on the track. And what she's plotting here is the start and the end of the place fields as a rat runs around the track. And just what's the location of, of each place field where it starts and where's the ending location of the place field? And what she sees very clearly is that the place fields tend to start and end at these transitions between the different textures on the track. So they're not uniformly distributed around the track. There's something about this transition between the textures that, that, that at least over time, you know, after many stable trainings, that the cells tend to start and end their place fields there. Now, of course, not all of them. A lot of place fields uh, have their firing fields that cross over the track. And even some of them uh, have very tight fields right at, at, at the boundaries. But there's something about the, the, the surface cues on the track that's, that, is, that is sculpting uh, the, 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 the um, shape of, of each place field. Now, what I should say is that uh, it's also interesting that the animals tend to stop at these transitions and do this head scanning behavior that we uh, reported a couple of years ago, which is associated with new place fields being formed. I'm not going to show any data there, but we have to look at that. So we're not certain whether it's the texture itself that's doing this or the fact that the rack tends to stop there and look around, and we know how that affects place fields might be uh, what, what's causing this sculpting. But certainly something's going on related to the, uh, the, the boundaries on the track that, that's sculpting how these place fields form. Uh, this is just some, uh, I won't go with this, this is just some sh uh, standard shuffling techniques and bootstrapping statistics we did to show that, that this is a, a, a statistically significant, but I, I think it's pretty straightforward and obvious that it is from, from these graphs. This is, these are you know, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of place fields over about three dozen rats that all, all pool together. So that's one cue about you know, that place fields are, are being somehow controlled by these local surface textures. Now, uh, 
I'm going to move forward on that, still with this idea about this double rotation experiment, to talk about some work that, that Heek Young Lee, a uh, now postdoc who's, who's sitting over there, uh, did with Chung Wang in, in, in the lab, uh, recording along the proximal distal axis of CA3 in the same double rotation experiment. What Ina Lee in the lab previously had shown that uh, the CA3 representation was much more coherent than the CA1 representation in this experiment. So I already showed you evidence that the CA1 place fields uh, often split. Uh, in CA3, we saw much less evidence of that, especially this part of CA3 where the recordings were, were from, more intermediate and distal CA3, uh, where the, the place fields, you got a lot of remapping, but very little evidence of a split representation. And we interpreted that in terms of perhaps attractive dynamics, keeping the representation stable and coherent. Uh, but what, what Heek Young and Chung did was recorded all along the axis from proximal to distal CA3. And there's reason to believe that in proximal CA3, you may, you may see much less of that uh, coherence. And that's exactly what they found. So uh, each of these graphs here is just a, a, a population correlation matrix. Uh, the x-axis down here just shows location along the track in one session. And along this y-axis is location in, the, in another session. So these are uh, representations of, of the correlations between one standard session and another standard session. And the high, the high correlation along the main diagonals, that just means it's a place cell map that's stable. Place fields that fire at this part of the track in one session also fire at the same location in the second session. Cells that fire at this location on the track fire at the same location in the second session. Okay, that, that's what that diagonal means. It's a nice stable representation. And that's true in proximal CA3, intermediate, and distal. Now, what about in the double rotation experiment? Uh, this is just showing the, the, four, the different types of double rotation uh, uh, mismatches we have. What we find in distal CA3 and intermediate CA3, uh, He Kyung and Chung replicated Ina Lee's experiment that the representation stays coherent. You can see this nice band of high correlation uh, in, in, in all different mismatch amounts. And notice that the band of correlation goes below the main diagonal, increasing amounts with increasing mismatch amount, that's showing you that the CA3 representation is actually controlled by the local cues on the track, not by the global cues on the wall. Proximal CA3 is much more messier. You actually start losing the correlation. And this actually looks very similar to the work in the Dente gyrus that my student Josh Nunebel showed a couple of years ago. That in proximal CA3, you see what much more looks much more remapping. You, you, you lose the, uh, the, the coherence of the representation in proximal CA3, uh, which actually, um, uh, uh, given that that's what the Dente gyrus does too, uh, it suggests that proximal CA3 really should be considered more uh, functionally uh, as a unit with the Dente gyrus than CA3. It's got less uh, strong recurrent collaterals. It has stronger inputs from the Dente gyrus. And there's some behavioral work from Kessner's group uh, suggesting that that's uh, uh, true. So anyway, uh, so that's just another interesting story that, that there's, um, along this axis is definitely a, a, a gradient of, of, of the, um, the nonlinear kind of pattern completion we like to think about it, or error correction, generalization. Uh, a lot of terms you can use that seem to uh, result from the same uh, underlying uh, putative attractive dynamics from the recurrent collaterals. But what's also very interesting and is uh, when you look along proximal to distal CA1, uh, proximal CA1 gets input primarily from distal CA3, and distal CA1 gets input primarily from proximal CA3. Uh, we also know that medial internal cortex projects pro to proximal CA1. Lateral internal cortex projects to distal CA1. So that suggests that what we should see differences along this proximal distal axis in CA1 in the same manipulation. Uh, and this is indeed what uh, Sach and Deshmukh uh, showed. So this is the same graphs I showed before, just in a grayscale. Uh, when you look at the standard session versus the standard session, you see these nice bands of high correlation that shows the CA1 map is stable across the uh, standard conditions. Uh, it may be hard to see here, but uh, hopefully you'll be able to see that in proximal and intermediate CA1, you see the, the representation splits apart. I'm not sure if you can kind of see that there's a, 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 a red line there and a green line. The red line here shows control by the local cues, the green by the distal cues. But what you, can, you can at least see that there are two bands of, of correlation here. That's showing the split representation uh, in CA1 proximal and an intermediate. But surprisingly to us, uh, in the distal part of CA1, there's much, it's much more strongly a single band that's actually 
along this green line above the main diagonal. That's actually showing that distal CA1 is being controlled by the global landmarks on the wall, not the local cues. Well, that really surprised and confused us. We, can, we, can, we understand, we think, why the proximal CA1 cells have the split representation. Uh, CA3, distal, is controlled by the local cues on the track. Uh, the medial interrontal cortex, I haven't shown you this, but other work that we've done before has shown that the medial interrontal cortex cells are controlled by the global cues on the wall. So proximal CA1 gets some input from interrontal cortex saying, go with the cues on the wall, input from CA3 saying, go with the cues on the track, and CA1, not having the recurrent collateral system, it's just more of a feed-forward network, it input split, CA1's output split. But what about this part of distal CA1. Well, we've already shown that proximal CA3 remaps. We think it's sort of like a pattern separation uh, effect, uh, presumably due to a lot, large part from the inputs from the dentate gyrus. So it's got a very weak signal, if anything, controlled slightly by the local cues. We've already, I didn't show data here, but we published uh, data also that the lateral interrontal cortex, which has a very weak si spatial signal to begin with, is also very, that weak sp signal is controlled, if anything, by the local cues. Yet, Distal CA1 seems to have a global Q output. So where is that global Q coming from? We scratched our heads and puzzled about this for a long time until I remembered, uh, you know, and this is actually, uh, uh, we heard about it from, from, from Peirosh and, 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 and Vijaki talk earlier. Uh, it turns out there are head direction cells or units that are around here. And we've recorded them over the years, you see them, and then, uh, uh, Leutgeb and Mizumori have shown that you can get uh, head direction units around here. So actually, this is why this is part of this head direction symposium. Our hypothesis is that, that what's, what's controlling the distal CA1 output here is the, in, the, the head direction input coming in here. If head direction cells are coming in here influencing these CA1 cells, and the only competing signal are these really weak signals from the local cues. We think that's why uh, the, the distal CA1 is being controlled by the global cues. The strongest input uh, in our experiments uh, over here in this double rotation are from the head direction cells, which we think is now explains why we see this gradient along the proximal distal axis there. Okay, I'm going to finish up with some object-related activity. Uh, another experiment that Sachin Deshmukh did in our lab uh, after recording object-related responses in lateral entorontal cortex uh, also uh, recorded them in hippocampus and just a, a big uh, open field with different objects, different toys along here. And uh, Neil uh, Verge has already uh, mentioned this in his talk where what Sachin found was some place cells uh, seem to encode this vector relationship to the objects. Actually very similar to a, a, a proposal Bruce made a number of years ago about object vector coding uh, of, of place cells. So here's a cell that was a place cell. Sachin introduced objects, and that didn't affect the place cell, but you, what you saw over different sessions that the cell started developing secondary and tertiary fields, and each of those fields had the same distance and direction relative to one of the objects. Here's one example of a cell. Here's a second example of another cell that's had two of these fields and then developed a third one, all to the south uh, of, of three of the four objects. Uh, Vyash Pugliotti is a, a grad student in the lab, and he's been uh, following that up. Uh, he's been doing experiments in darkness now. So do, do, does the hippocampus need the visual input to see these object vector cells? And the answer is no. Uh, in this experiment, he's got three objects here in this triangular uh, uh, relationship in the center, and that's a, a, a cell, uh, a place field, and repeats it. Now, in this session, uh, he rotates the three objects by 120 degrees, but this cell is not affected. So you would say this is just a standard place cell. But another cell actually had this vector relationship. You can see it clearly here. The cell fires to the southeast direction of the objects. Interestingly, when he rotates the objects, the two fields now attach themselves to these two objects. They're maintaining the same allocentric direction in terms of the directional component of this vector. They're just shifting which objects they attach themselves to. Uh, and then when the objects go back in the same orientation as before, they return to before. And now, interestingly, when we remove the objects, the place fields are still there. So, so they don't need the objects to fire there. Somehow they become incorporated into the, the underlying spatial map representation, we think. Uh, so um, uh, either that or there's some residue left behind of the objects. We can't, we can't say there's not some residue left behind that the rat is picking up. But, but whatever it is, it doesn't need those physical objects that were there. Uh, what he's also done, interesting, we, we found one case where um, 
uh, we saw an anomalous rotation of the place field. So here's one cell, second cell. In session three, this is in darkness. For some whatever reason, the place field rotated 90 degrees in this session before coming back. And here's another cell simultaneously recorded that also rotated 90 degrees and then came back. Here are these two of these cells of this object relationship. You see the cross hairs here just show reference frames relative to the object. What you see here is this, these two cells, and now, it's, it's, now in this session, it's firing based on all three cells. In the, in the session where the place field spontaneously rotated, what you see is the, the, the firing fields of these object cells rotated by the same amount, but relative to their objects. So here you can see this cell is firing to the north of the object, and now if you look at the crosshairs, it's firing to the west of the object, and then it comes back again. Here's another cell that's firing in this uh, uh, southeast quadrant relative to this object. It stays there. In this session, now it's firing in the southwest quadrant relative to the object and comes back again. If this had followed the reference frame of the platform or the room, you would see this cell firing over here, but it's clearly not doing that. It's rotating around the object itself. So uh, we're doing similar things with actually now cue manipulations where we're actually taking cues on the wall, I'm donating by a cue card here. They're really more standard, uh, complex cues. Here are place fields that rotate with the cue, now in the light now, rotate with the cues. Uh, uh, when you rotate the cues 90 degrees, the place fields on the edge rotate 90 degrees. Uh, but here's another one of these cells that seems to rotate uh, around the object itself, uh, not rotating uh, uh, in, around the reference frame of the platform of the room itself. So what we think is going on here is that uh, just as we believe, you know, the head direction cells provide the, the compass, the directional component of the orientation of the map, well now we have these cells that have this vector relationship to individual objects are also rotating. We think that we, 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 we hypothesize that the head direction cells are also providing this directional component to these cells, but, but rather than a, a, a compass in, in the framework of the room itself or the platform, it's tied to uh, uh, the, the framework relative to these local objects. So uh, I'll just finish up to summarize, and the, the, the cells, the head direction cells and place cells, they, they form an internally coherent representation that can be completely uncoupled from the external world, but remain tightly coupled to each other under many conditions. Uh, the head direction cells appear to be controlled more strongly by the distal landmarks, unless, you know, Andre really screws up the rats with the, <laughs> and you know, with, 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 I'll give them something to do. <laughs> uh, um, uh, but but uh, in our experience, at least, they're controlled by the distal landmarks. The surface textures can influence the place field locations. And a small subset of these place cells, it's about, only about 5% of the cells, uh, so that, that's one reason why they're hard to study. You don't get many of them. But they seem to encode these, these optic vector relationships. Uh, we, th we assume the head direction cell signal provides a direction component to these cells, just as it provides the overall allothetic direction signal to the place cell map. So I'll uh, just to finish up, uh, I think I mentioned everyone's name who did all the recordings in the lab. These are just people over the years in my lab. So thanks very much.